Maybe we can get started and Sue will, will, will get you to call in off your cell phone for, for your session. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, U of T Grand Rounds. As some of you may have heard, um, I'm down in Costa Rica for our annual surgical mission with the residents. Um, but I did hear you guys got some snow, so it's perfect timing. Um, nonetheless, I'm thrilled to be here this morning um, to introduce Dr. Markowitz and Dr. Nido, um, who I have the pleasure of working with very closely through UHN. And they are both incredible assets to our Department of Ophthalmology and to our patients. They do great work. Uh, Dr. Markowitz, if you're not familiar, is, the, is a full professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto, and he's world-renowned as a specialist in low vision re rehabilitation. Um, his practice at this point is completely limited to patients with low vision rehabilitation needs, and he has a long track record in clinical practice as well as research um, in the areas of low vision. And Dr. Monica Nido is a pediatric ophthalmologist originally, who then further specialized in low vision rehabilitation. She completed her um, earlier studies at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and then completed her fellowship with Dr. Markowitz at the University of Toronto, and then stayed and was recruited to join uh, the faculty at the University of Toronto. She is a member of the Committee of Vision Rehabilitation at the COS, and an assistant professor in our department at the University of Toronto. So I'd like to welcome both um, to host our grand rounds this morning. I look forward to your talks. Thank you, Dr. Rai. Jenny, could you present the first and second slides, please? So today we're going to talk about low vision rehabilitation, why and how. Let's present you the agenda. So we are going to start with two cases presented by our residents and followed by Dr. Markowitz, who will talk about the whole of, of us as ophthalmologists in North America. All of us should cooperate with low vision rehabilitation. And finally, our guest Sue Marshwoods will, from the Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada will present their work. And uh, as a multidisciplinary team, we, we refer most of our patients for low vision rehabilitation Canada for further training. So let's start with the cases. Jenny, you're muted. It wouldn't be Zoom if someone wasn't muted. Jenny, Sorry, you're still muted. So there you go. Perfect. <laughs> Um, so my name is Jenny, and I'm one of the PGY2 residents in the program. I would like to thank Drs. Nido, Markowitz, and Nawasa for their help in putting together this presentation. So the first case is Miss M. She's a 78-year-old female who's been experiencing blurry vision in her right eye, where she sees shadows and ghosting of images. This improves with occluding her right eye, which is her dominant eye. Her other past ocular history includes cataract surgery of both eyes in 2019 and an epiretinal membrane in the right eye for which she does not want surgery. So this vision has impacted all of her daily activities, particularly her ability to see the screen for tennis matches on the TV. So overall, it has led to a pretty low quality of life. On assessment of her visual acuity, she had 20-40 distance vision in the left eye and 20-20 in the right. Um, and with both eyes open, she had 20-25. For near, she had 20-20 with both eyes open. And you can see she has reduced contrast sensitivity as well. So on OCT, she had an epiretinal membrane in the right eye, which distorted the normal foveal contour. And her left eye was normal. So this microperimetry test shows her a current fixation area, which is 0 0.2 square degrees. Normal patients have a small fixation area, usually around 0 0.1 square degrees, illustrating good fixation stability. However, when there's a lesion in the fovea, the fixation can become unstable. Microperimetry also maps out the retinal sensitivity of each point on the fundus with Norm, um, normal being the green dots and abnormal sensitivity being the orange dots. So this green patch shows her current preferred retinal locus, 
which is centered on an area of abnormal retinal sensitivity due to her epiretinal membrane. However, there is a potential area of better fixation that is just superior to it. And her microperimetry of the left eye was normal. So this shows how for the machine um, used for biofeedback training, it can select a preferred retinal locus that has better retinal sensitivity superior to a patient's current retinal locus. And this area can be tested prior to undergoing biofeedback training with prisms. So with three base up prisms at the distance, she improved her vision to 2030 in the left and 2020, or sorry, 2030 in the right, 2020 in the left, and 2020 with both eyes open. And at near with two base up prisms, she maintained 2020 vision. And both um, at both distances, she had no more symptoms. So this biofeedback training involves five weekly sessions of 20 minutes each, and each trained point is in blue here, and it represents an eye fixation movement that can be augmented with audio and luminous stimuli. So this shows her post-biofeedback training results. She improved her vision in the right eye to 2025, and near vision improved to 2015. Her retinal sensitivity increased from 18.5 to 20 decibels, and her fixation stability improved from 0.2 to 0.1 square degrees. The new preferred retinal locus um, was relocated to 0.51 degrees superior to her original retinal locus. Her, her contrast sensitivity also improved. And again, this shows how her retinal sensitivity increased by 1.5 decibels with more points on the retina being in green, illustrating normal retinal sensitivity. So the final result was that she had total symptom improvement and could see the tennis match on the TV again. However, when she tried using progressive glasses, her vision worsened again. So now we have a question for the audience, which is why did her symptoms worsen with progressive glasses? Is it because her epiretinal membrane uh, progressed in the right eye? Was she suppressing the left eye? Biofeedback training lost its effect or the optic center was off her new trained retinal locus? Thanks, Jenny. I'm gonna give that a couple more seconds, although there seems to be overwhelming consensus. So here you go. Yeah, so everyone um, got this right. It was because her optic center was off the trained retinal locus with progressives, she was forced to use a different retinal locus that had worse retinal sensitivity than her new one. Monica and Sam, you've done a great job of training everybody. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you. And just as a bit of background on epiretinal membrane, it's a very common retinal disease with a prevalence of 2 to 34%. Most cases are idiopathic, although an association with PVD has been found. Usually patients experience mild symptoms and have quite good vision. If there are severe symptoms, a vitrectomy can be performed, which is the gold standard. However, there is a risk of complications. So for patients that do not want surgery or only have mild symptoms, biofeedback training can be used as an adjuvant form of therapy. And this is a part of um, one of the tools we can use in modern medical vision rehabilitation as well. So just as a bit of background, biofeedback training has been used for 25 years now in fields including gastroenterology, odontology, urology, and ophthalmology. It's been used for vision rehabilitation in other ophthalmological conditions, such as nystagmus, stargardts, myopia, macular degeneration, glaucoma, neurological hemianopia, macular hole, retinitis pigmentosa, and optic neuropathy. So the rationale behind biofeedback training is that the oculomotor neuron controls fixation stability. 
So by rehabilitating the motor neuron, patients have a potential to improve their fixation stability. There are latent neuronal connections that exist for eccentric viewing, and these synapses can be activated and amplified by audio and luminous stimuli. So for example, if a patient's preferred retinal locus is on an unfavorable location, as in this case, because it's next to a scar, um, it can be retrained to be on a more favorable location with better retinal sensitivity. And these are um, some other publications in the literature for uh, work on biofeedback training and some of Dr. Nito and Markowitz's publications as well. So thank you so much. And now Sonia has another case as well. Okay, perhaps before we get to that, if um, any of the panelists have any comments, now would be a great time, some pearls for the, for the audience. That was a great case, thank you. Um, I just want to disclose that was my aunt. She came from Brazil just for the biofeedback because she had this surgery, cataract surgery with the membrane, but she didn't want vitrectomy. I told her we can help you. And she spent a month with us. She, she got really happy and she's still happy with the treatment. It's been six months since we did it. And she's still really happy about that. No more ghosts. Uh, I just want to add uh, also to, usually low vision is defined from 2050 and lower uh, in the better eye. And here we have a case which usually we would consider more or less within the normal range, except in one eye, which is a bit poorer. Mm. And even those patients who are not uh, defined by all the definitions as low vision still have problems like this case, uh, one, one pathology is in one eye and methods used in vision rehabilitation like prisons or biofeedback could help them quite uh, significantly as you saw in this case. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Sonia, I think the floor is yours. Oh, uh, sorry, there, there is a question before we move on. Uh, from Dr. Epstein, how long does this renewed location endure? It may endure forever. Uh, maybe if they forget, we can also give reinforcements, but I've been following these patients for three, four years so far, and usually they keep these skills uh, for a new PRL. Patients end at the end with uh, vision at the um, subsequent PRLs or fixation points, which they develop through this process. Got it. And actually, you know, I, I have a follow-up question on that. Suppose mm -hmm. you have somebody with disease like, you know, geographic atrophy that's slowly expanding. So if you put their PRL into an area where the atrophy <laughs> expands into, can you move their PRL again? Yeah, <laughs> you, you move on. Sure, okay. you, you change the disease, basically. The problem is, is, as we get more and more into the periphery, yes. uh, the, the quality of vision is not as good as it was. not But they gain something else, a very good point. They gain, again, binocular vision, meaning vision on... Um, on uh, corresponding retinal areas. And that's basically better quality of vision than having monocular vision in one eye. I just wanted to emphasize that we tested first with the three prisms base up, two prisms base up, to see if the good eye wouldn't be affected by the biofeedback because we trained the dominant, but maybe the other eye would be worsening. But that was not the case. It kept 2020. The patient could adjust to the prisms and so to the biofeedback. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, Sonia, I apologize. Now the floor is yours. <laughs> Dr. Rai, um, I'd like to thank Drs. Misawa, Dr. Naido, and uh, Dr. Markowitz uh, for their help and guidance in preparing this presentation. My name is Sonia. I'm a PGY2 um, at the University of Toronto as well.
So I'll be presenting the case of JN, a 15-year-old male with a history of optic pathway glioma in 2016, who underwent partial resection in 2017 and completed vinblastin therapy in 2019. His past medical history is notable for neurofibromatosis type 1, attention deficit disorder without hyperactivity, Tourette syndrome, and a homonymous heavy anopia. On low vision assessment, the patient states that he misses and bumps into objects and people on his left, and he has a lot of difficulty reading at school. Um, on low vision assessment, the patient had 20-20 near and distance vision. His reading speed was 148 words per minute, uh, lower than expected for his age. Uh, we typically expect uh, 190 uh, words per minute. And he had normal contrast sensitivity in both eyes. Microperimetry performed on JN demonstrated a left homonymous hemianopia. So to address his, um, his concerns, uh, both his low vision, um, his low um, rate of reading and um, his left homonymous hemianopia, the patient was uh, started on an experimental modern low vision rehabilitation program called the Immersive Virtual Reality NeuroFi Training Program. Uh, briefly, it's a six-week audiovisual stimulation program uh, whereby patients uh, place an Oculus Go headset on and uh, are asked to uh, track 3D multiple objects. They do this every other day for roughly 15 minutes per session at home uh, under the control of a lab remotely, and they do this for a totality of 20 sessions. Uh, this is the program. It's done um, at UHN and the University of Toronto. And the goal of this program effectively is just to track spheres as they bounce around on a 3D screen. So just so, so you get a sense of what it's like, um, essentially the patient puts on the headset and spheres appear within um, their, their field of view. There is one sphere that is cued in red and it returns to yellow after five seconds. Once we've cued the, 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 the sphere of focus, all the spheres start moving randomly for 20 seconds. And after 20 seconds, um, the spheres stop moving. At this point, the patient must select using a laser pointer, the ball corresponding to the one that had previously been cued. The result is displayed, uh, whether or not the patient has gotten um, the, the selection correct or has missed it, um, it's cued. And then we return to sequence one and they do this for 15 minutes. So these are the results of our patient who completed the, the, the training program. 15 days after completion of treatment um, or, or after completion of this program, his near vision improved. His reading speed improved from 148 words per minute to 170 word, words per minute. And um, he developed a smaller um, fixation point. Um, he, he had a smaller bivariate contour ellipse uh, area um, at 0.1 degrees. Sorry about that. Um, so in terms of his visual field, uh, there was improvement in his visual field as well, uh, noted both in the right and left eye, and also noted in uh, binocular visual field testing using the Esterman field. With regards to his microperimetry, um, there was improvement in the relative scotomas in both eyes. These are highlighted in the red circles. You can see that uh, the points uh, are green, which are uh, closer to normal. And his parametric retinal sensitivity also increased in both eyes from 17.3 to 19.9 in the right eye and from 18.4 to 19.1 in the left eye. So a question for the audience. Um, do you think these changes in the patient's visual fields um, slash microperimetry are due to one, uh, learning effect, Two, lack of reliability. Three, uh, some level of field restitution. Or four, the fixation was relocated designedly. Thanks, Sonia. We'll give that a few seconds for the audience to get their votes in. All right, and there's a bit more of a split than what, what uh, Jenny had in her, so here you go. Okay, interesting. Um, Okay, so uh, it's a tie between learn eff learning effect and the fixation was relocated designedly. Uh, the answer is actually uh, three or C, some level of field restitution occurred. So field restitution therapies um, aim to recover visual field deficits. 
It's been shown to be possible today through perceptual learning and has been demonstrated in both animal and human studies. Uh, the biggest proponents of this um, idea are Sable, Huxlin, Fobert, and Kasten, and we'll be referencing these, these authors uh, quite, a, quite a bit in this presentation. Very briefly, um, after brain injury, conscious vision, which is located in the primary visual cortex, or V1, is severely impaired. And the visual deficits that occur as a result of, of either trauma or a malignancy were previously thought to be permanent. However, um, studies have demonstrated that several visual pathways actually survive V1 damage. And these mediate residual or so-called unconscious functions that are often called blind sight. And it's this second component, this so-called blind sight, that is of interest when we talk about field restitution. The term blind sight um, was first coined in 1974 by Weisskrantz and colleagues, and it refers to an above chance performance of patients with cortical blindness who are asked to detect or discriminate uh, stimuli within their blind field. And this phenomenon, you know, the fact that they can uh, have a performance that is better than luck, suggests that there is some preserved visual processing ability in individuals with cortical blindness. Now, the question, of course, is how is that possible? Uh, and it really boils down to, uh, to brain plasticity. So typically, um, after brain trauma, you have injury to the ventral pathways, uh, which is uh, in the primary visual cortex. Uh, it relays input to the primary visual cortex, or V1. And so you have um, loss of the ventral pathway, which relays static stimuli. There's a second pathway that allows for visual um, perception, which is the dorsal pathway. And this relays dynamic stimuli. And so though you have loss of the ventral pathway, which is the V1 pathway, there are other inputs through V2 to V5 that continue um, uh, uh, being relayed. Um, and it appears that the brain can relay the input from dynamic stimuli to retrain V2 to V5 to also perceive static stimuli. So in other words, um, field restitution occurs when there is reorganization of the functional connectivity and subcortical and cortical visual areas. So you, um, you uh, bypass V1 and go through V2 to V5. This has been demonstrated in a few studies by Huxlin. Uh, here he shows um, uh, improved uh, uh, blind, the improved field restitution following training, uh, using dynamic stimuli, following immersive virtual reality, and using functional MRI data. Uh, Huxton and colleagues also demonstrated uh, more connectivity um, following training. So red here suggests uh, neuronal connectivity, uh, blue suggests le less activity. So there's more con uh, connectivity following um, training. Now, because we're relying on dynamic stimuli, it makes perfect sense that 3D multiple object tracking stimulations are the perfect methodology to retrain uh, the brain following traumatic ischemic insults. Uh, the first publications that were done uh, on this topic relied on large TV screens and patients had to present to institutions to do this program. And the program that was done at the University of Toronto, however, is actually home-based, so it's more convenient um, for patients and a little bit more cost-effective as well. Now, this is not a training program that is solely focused or, or has purposes only for patients with pathology or cortical blindness. It's actually also of interest in um, high-performing um, high athletes, specifically basketball players, who need to hone their peripheral attention and perception, and so they've been um, doing these types of training as well. Now at the University of Toronto and specifically the Low Vision Service, uh, multiple case reports have been published uh, regarding this 3D, pro uh, 3D immersive reality, uh, virtual reality simulation programs. And a study has actually been completed at the University of Toronto also on this topic. It's titled Vision Rehabilitation in a Pediatric Population of Patients with Hemianopia, a pilot study on virtual reality stimulation. And it was published uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Misawa, Dr. Naido, Dr. Markowitz, and colleagues. Uh, briefly about the methodology, uh, six children were enrolled between the ages of eight to 18. Um, their hemianopia was secondary to brain tumor. Uh, there was a six week audiovisual um, IVR tele rehabilitation program that was performed, and it was home based but laboratory controlled remotely. 
And the results are very promising. Uh, one month after completion of this uh, treatment, uh, five out of six patients had improvement in their visual fields. Six out of six had improvement in contrast sensitivity and fixation stability. And overall, the patient cohort had increased reading speed, significantly better QOL or quality of life, and improved microperimetry. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you to the residents. I'd like to comment that uh, the learning effect is uh, lasting for one week. After a week, the test is not considered to have a learning effect. The patients forget again about the test. So uh, that's why we suppose it's uh, some field restitution. And second, we have to see the clinical correlation. When contrast, uh, fixation stability, reading speed, all the variables improved. So we can think that the visual field improvements are for real, right? And uh, three points at Humphrey, they mean uh, an improvement classically. This is for glaucoma, but actually for amenopsia, they consider that any improvements may be significant, especially in my properimetry where the, uh, there is an eye tracker. So every point is monitored by the eye tracker. Any improvements are really consistent. So we, we pay much attention to that. If anybody has a question or Dr. Marco is. I just want to make a comment again. Um, this is a case where um, a kid with 2020 vision and yet uh, he, he or she had still um, functional deficits like reading. So um, uh, kids actually get early interventions and training and devices uh, through the School for the Blind, I think in Brantford and, and through the CNIB at a very early stage. Uh, and at some point, some, some people may be simply happy, it's 2020, but patients still complain there are still uh, problems. And here for a functional improvement like reading, you need in most cases, a larger span of vision, a larger span of the field to perform better. And uh, this methodology, um, um, it uh, in large basically produces field, what we call field restitution. And we dare say, yes, there is some field restitution because we could prove it with micro perimetry and then we confirm it with automated perimetry like everybody would like us to do. Uh, so that's a short comment. <laughs> Thank you. Now there is a question from Dr. Lutchman, and actually I have the same question. Is there a maintenance program? <laughs> uh, okay, Dr. Mark, you would like to say. No, you go ahead first. No, actually not yet. This is a pilot study. We are starting with the Sick Kids Hospital and with Dr. Michael Riber. So we are still formulating the, the methodology if we are going to increase the, the number of sessions or not. So it's nothing. Uh, clinical yet. It's, it's experimental. In theory, we believe that there will not need to be a maintenance program because you talk here about producing brain plasticity, retraining other um, layers in the cortex to assume function and producing basically permanent uh, field uh, restitution. Excellent. Thank you. Monica, I guess we'll go on to the next. Okay. Session. I just wanted uh, to thank Dr. Misawa, our fellow who helped preparing all the cases. And thank you, Dr. Misawa. Now we're having Dr. Markowitz. Thank you. I'll share my screen. Uh, okay, here we are. Here we are. Thank you. So from the detail to, to the general, I just want to give a, a background and remind everybody um, on the background of low vision rehabilitation today in Canada, in essence. So um, basically all the guidelines, what um, we use today in the United States and Canada, 
um, uh, were developed more or less about uh, 20 years ago at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, a division rehab committee, which um, due to demand from the public at the time, they produced uh, a guideline for practice of low vision, the rehabilitation by ophthalmology, and we called it the smart side. We at the time, the members of the vision rehabilitation presented for the first time publicly this, um, this guideline at the International Conference in London, Vision 2005. Uh, very shortly afterwards, Board of Directors of the American Academy of Ophthalmology adopted the guideline as a permanent guideline for all ophthalmologists in the United States. And it introduced it in the clinical practice uh, patterns, those booklets which um, all ophthalmologists in the United States um, use, and we also use them in Canada for training and, and uh, clinical and, uh, guideline for, for us and our practice. About the, uh, and this was back in 2005. About the same time in 2006, um, a special issue of um, the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology, totally dedicated to low vision rehabilitation was published. And it's, this issue more or less serves as the guidelines for, for us in Canada. In that issue, there are quite a few articles talking about low vision rehabilitation in Canada. But um, there were two pieces. One was produced by Dr. Mary Lou Jackson, our colleague from uh, Vancouver, and she introduced SmartSight to the Canadian audience and recommended it for the Canadian audience. Um, at the same time, a centerpiece of um, principle of modern low vision uh, rehabilitation was introduced as well which I put together for that, um, for that edition. Both those guidelines serve us in Canada. And basically they both have um, declared four principles that all ophthalmologists must, must identify low vision in their practice. All ophthalmologists must address low vision rehabilitation in their practice. And if appropriate care cannot be provided, then they have to, to, to refer. Um, provision of aspects of low vision rehabilitation is optional. Not everybody has to do everything. And uh, guidelines are available for various levels of involvement with vision rehabilitation services. Now, um, about what, 15 or 16 years later, last year, the WHO came out with a package of eye care interventions. And in that package, there is actually a section on priority low vision rehabilitation, which um, actions which are recommended to member states worldwide. And they include basically the items listed here. You have to refer for vision rehabilitation to specialists and all kinds of providers. You, you, you should provide optical assistive products, non-optical assistive programs, uh, electronic devices, provision of advice and um, for the environment uh, for adaptation orientation mobility training, and provision vision skills training. So those are the guidelines at the level of states and international. Going uh, locally in Canada, actually, we, we, have, we have lots of thoughts and documents related to, to low vision rehabilitation. And actually modern low vision rehabilitation is part and parcels of the Royal College mandates for um, accredited teaching university programs for ophthalmology. And in essence, what it says, 
each program has to have the practice teaching and research of low vision rehabilitation. And this is how the program at the University of Toronto came into being about um, 25 years ago, and uh, also at other university centers across Canada. Uh, going furthermore, in Ontario, actually starting from uh, 2008, there are actually legislated guidelines on the modern definition of what is low vision. It's basically related to low vision acuity, um, best corrected visual acuity, less in the better eye, less than 2050, um, significant ocular motor dysfunction, and visual defects, which are listed here, um, all not amenable to any medical or surgical treatment. Furthermore, at the same time, again, legislated in Ontario through OHIP, there are guidelines for what would be considered as modern intervention and low vision rehabilitation, which OHIP recognizes and um, would pay for such services to physicians. So um, there are eight points in the legislation and the OHIP schedule of benefits, which relate to cognitive assessment, assessment of residual visual functions, which include visual acuity, macular perimetry, contrast sensitivity, assessment of PRLs, functional assessment um, of uh, near vision, uh, of reading, uh, prescribing of low vision devices, preparation of a vision rehabilitation plan, and also very important, supervision by physicians of training programs in accordance with recognized programs for the use of devices of improvement of skills. Uh, so as you could see, all this we have in Ontario um, for, uh, for almost, what, 15 years, which uh, the WHO recommends in principle. We have this and more. To a certain extent, uh, and I'm not sure if it's legislated through, through uh, health programs in other provinces in Canada, there is provision of services for diagnosis, devices and training in other parts of Canada, and maybe we'll uh, touch briefly afterwards. Furthermore, in Ontario, again, um, recognizing the importance of low vision rehabilitation um, services, uh, OHIP will pay physicians a fee for um, initial vision rehabilitation and for follow-up vision, which is um, a very generous program uh, in order to provide constant assistance by physician low vision uh, patients. Furthermore, um, so, okay, just to remind, also in other provinces of Canada, like Alberta, I believe in, in uh, British Columbia, uh, there is some coverage for physicians providing low vision rehabilitation. Some provinces though, unfortunately, there is no such coverage, coverage from the healthcare programs. In Ontario, again, going to devices, there is a generous, provision for coverage for low vision devices through the assistive device program. And in some cases it could be up to 100% of the fees. In most of the cases it's for 75% of the fees with provision for um, uh, on the number and how many times people could get those devices. For a physician, in Ontario, there is a coverage uh, within those fees for um, a training, supervised training for um, programs for training for a better vision for rehab and especially for rehabilitation of skills depending on vision. And there is an even a larger program in Ontario um, 
for the Vision Loss uh, Rehabilitation Canada, which the government pays for uh, and subsidizes their services. So uh, altogether, in Ontario and, um, and other provinces in Canada, especially in the bigger ones, uh, in Quebec, Alberta, British Columbia, um, th there, is, um, there are um, low vision programs which, um, which are designed to help the population uh, and provide uh, help to, for those who are visually impaired. Just one point in Quebec, all the services are provided with the help of optometrists and the provincial system does not um, support to the best of my knowledge uh, payment for physicians um, doing low vision rehabilitation unless they work in uh, specifically designed um, centers in the province. Yet there are studies um, many years already looking again that in spite of the programs available in Ontario and in Canada, only about 20 or 30% of those who need help eventually get help. And that's a bit puzzling and looking at the different causes basically, time and again, we identify that the cooperation or the referrals from prescriber or practitioners like ophthalmologists or optometrists is less than um, one should be or one desires. And at the same time, from the other side, um, the awareness among the public and among uh, the visually impaired people is also less than it should be. Uh, so um, uh, on, on this point, basically, I am uh, actually pitching for low vision rehabilitation, especially to you, the residents, the future generation of practitioners uh, on behalf of myself and Dr. Nido. We want you on our team. We want you to participate and get an interest in low vision rehabilitation. Uh, it's actually a win-win situation for everybody, for us as practitioners, for the public, for, uh, for, the, for the community. Um, just as a reminder again, uh, low vision rehabilitation today in uh, Canada and Ontario, there are two parts. One is mandatory, accordingly to all the guidelines. All ophthalmologists must identify and must address low vision rehabilitation in their practice. And the other part, which is larger, it's optional, and basically relates to the provision of aspects of vision rehabilitation. So all are welcome to join. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. Uh, so we don't work alone. We work with other teams, especially Division Loss Rehabilitation Canada. So the next panelist is Sue Marsh Woods, Sue is a regional manager client service at the Vision Loss Rehabilitation Ontario, and she has for a long time cooperated with our service. Most of the patients we see, again, they go to, to her service, so she's going to present today. Oh, you know what, Sue, we still can't hear you. Um, Sue, can you give me a thumbs up if your phone number ends in 1653? Yes, okay, so I'm gonna unmute you here. Uh, now try. I apologize, everyone. We're having some difficulties with Sue's audio this morning. So we're just trying to get her on her cell phone. And you have to unmute yourself on your cell phone. Let's see if that works. No. You can so Monica, share these slides. I'll, I can help yeah. her. If you, if, Sue, if Why you can see the slides, Monica can maybe ha we'll have to deliver them. We're still not having any luck with that. Why you try so I can comment on your slides the best sure. I can. Thank you. Okay, could you put in presentation mode, please?
So are you able to expand to presentation mode for the slides? If you, Sorry, go slide, yeah. if you go to slideshow at the top. Yep, right there. And from beginning at the left. The first button on the left. All the way, all the way at the left. All the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada, who we are and what we are. Usually we used to say when I arrived in Toronto, oh, let's refer to the CNIB, to the CNIB, but now it's not CNIB anymore. We call it Vision Laws Rehabilitation Canada. You can go to the next, please. Sue, you hear me? Sorry about that, guys. Sue, are you able to go to the next slide? We can't hear you. I apologize. Thank okay. you. So, uh, in 2017, CNIB obtained provision, provincial funding and rebranded rehabilitation service under the name Vision Laws Rehabilitation Canada. In 2018, they formally launched the new organization. In 2019, they got accreditation uh, as a corporate service. And in 2020, they launched their first strategic plan. You can pass the next, please. Sue? Okay. Uh, well, the, the vision loss rehabilitation therapy helps people with all levels of vision loss to develop and restore key daily living skills helping them enhance their independence, safety, and mobility. So ophthalmologists, optometrists, and other healthcare professionals refer their patients with vision loss for this therapy as part of their care plan, overall care, care plan. Uh, vision loss re rehab therapy is provided by certified therapists who will work with individuals and caregivers to create a personalized rehabilitation plan to meet their needs and goals. Can you pass the next? Uh, the goal of the service delivery is to provide the right service at the right time for the right person. It's customized. Uh, our certified specialists deliver services where individuals with vision loss need the most. The, the vision loss rehabilitation can see the patients in their homes, uh, over the phone, online, and at the centers across Ontario. It's funded by the government of Ontario. So the health consequences associated with vision loss extend well beyond the eye and visual system. As we know, vision loss can affect the patient's quality of life, independence, mobility, and has been linked to falls, injury, and spanning mental health, mental health, cognition, social functional, even employment, of course, and educational attainment. So it's a significant impact on their lives and uh, the complete loss or deterioration of existing eyesight can be frightening for the patient, patients and overwhelming, leaving those impacted with many questions about their ability to maintain their independence. So it is um, the sad part of low vision practice when we receive the patient for the first time and they are scared, they are depressed, they are crying with us. And it's very good to have the Vision Laws Rehabilitation Canada to offer because unfortunately is a small improvement the medical aspect can offer to the patients, but we still have help. Uh, so once you refer a patient uh, to the vision loss, the team will reach out to them directly within five business days. They work uh, to assess their needs and goals and develop a personal, personalized rehabilitation plan. This may include a, a range of services depending on the individual needs. The service, again, may be delivered in, in different places. Next. Um, okay, and the, the Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada guides the patient through the process of rehabilitation. 
and they follow the patient, the referrals, the, they give the support as well. The impact of vision loss has significant impact on learning and may be a factor with the other support that they are receiving. We'll closely with other healthcare professionals, they uh, understand the impact of the vision loss on learning. Next. Uh, for people with low vision, learning to use the sight they have left, the residual vision, can be life-changing. For example, uh, with their certified specialists, they provide information about the eye disease. They teach individuals on how to use lighting, color contrast to maximize the remaining vision. They help people select appropriate low vision aids and assistive technology from specialty, uh, telescopes, iPads, apps on the phone. And they teach individuals on how to use the devices for everyday tests, like reading small print on their medications, the labels, food packages, personal mail, newspapers, phone numbers, and recipes. And they can show the device helping to, assist, to watch TV, reading street signs, bus numbers. Next. So I love this list because this is what we don't have time to do in our offices, right? Even you in your general practice or us in our specialized practice, we have so many things to address that we don't have time to train the patients. So uh, I like this list because this includes all the details that the patients need. Um, where were you? The last one. Can you continue with the list, Sue? No, before that. Yes, techniques. I like this part, techniques for preparing the meals from pouring a cup of coffee to use the house appliances and cooking a full course meal. I have met a, a couple of patients who, who were totally blind, who couldn't see light, no light perception, and they got married. They would prepare their meals and travel together. I don't know how they could prepare their, their meals uh, by themselves, but this independence is possible. And I love that they do this work for us. Uh, organization and labeling techniques to easily locate and identify household and personal items such as medications, techniques for using the telephone, keeping track of phone numbers, how to use large print, braille and audio products to read and keep track of information, how to use products designed for individuals with vision loss, adaptive, uh, adaptive technology and apps. So we prescribe the telescope, for example, but they can help us teaching the patient on how to use it properly. Learning to travel independently with vision loss is an essential skill. Our certified specialists teach, uh, they are certified specialists teach individuals on how to navigate through their home safely, independently, uh, different types of canes, Wayfinding skills, including how to use landmarks, how to safety, uh, safely cross streets and intersections controlled by stop signs and traffic lights, how to use public transportation, and how to use GPS uh, assistive devices. Uh, it's very sad when we receive a couple and the man has lost his vision, the wife has to guide him everywhere, the patient has no independence, so we try to convince the patient to go to the vision loss, to have this kind of training for orientation mobility, so they have a life again. Not everybody wants that, but we try. Uh, okay, and there are technology products they help with. For example, the desktop CCTV, which is very expensive. They enroll the patient in government programs for funding. They help to choose the devices and the software on the computers. Next. They also do the work for children. They give the support they, they need, like braille preparation, tactile learning sessions, peer programs, provide parents with educational materials, access to local resources, workshops, on raising a child who is blind or, or partially sighted. OK, next. So I hope I have delivered the message properly. 
but I, I want you to know basically that when you refer to our service at the University of Toronto in low vision rehabilitation, we are covered. We work together with the vision loss. So ideally the patient should have our assessment to cover the glasses, the prisms, the eye movement training that they need, and even new research because we are tertiary service. And after that, we can uh, work together as we do with the vision loss. So if you have any questions. That's great, Monica, thank you. And I'll end the screen share there. Um, thank you. You know, I, I'll put in a plug myself. I think I've I've managed over the years to refer a number of patients to Dr. Nido and Dr. Markowitz, and the process has been very smooth and very beneficial for my patients. So, you know, we're very lucky to have you guys as a resource um, in the Toronto area. And we do have people on this call from all over the province and country, but um, maybe I can ask you to remind everybody how can they refer, I know there were some numbers on the screen, but how can they refer to you guys? Um, and what information do you want from us in the referral? <laughs> um, let, let me ask. I, I think the the best is to refer to our listed offices, you know. Um, okay. Usually uh, from there, um, usually if it comes to my office, uh, I always look where uh, where the patient lives, where the patient's coming from. So we try, we, we work throughout three clinics, one downtown Toronto, Toronto Western, and we have the location at the CNIB. So um, uh, it's our separate office at the CNIB. So we have a different phone number there. It's not the CNIB itself. So, so that's the best. In terms of information, um, <laughs> the diagnosis and uh, whatever uh, um, pathology related information you have, it helps us because we don't go over again to make a diagnosis. We take at face value what's written by the referring uh, doctor. And this guides, guides us what kind of approach to do. Obviously we could do our own testing still in the office like OCT or field testing or microperimetry, but um, it, it, it helps. Uh, thank you. I just want to mention at this time that we, we and commend that we have a long lasting relationship with the CNIB for since I remember like, <laughs> the department especially uh, has a long lasting relation with, uh, with the IVAN and now with the low vision program where um, one, my office, one of my offices is located in the CNIB building and we work, uh, I work with you for the last 25 years, I believe or so. Uh, yeah, and it's a very good um, relationship. And now with the reorganization of the CNIB, um, it's actually, it, it's perfect. I think I will arrange to broadcast our office contact information, the three offices contact information to uh, the group, to all the ophthalmology group. That would be great, thank you. And Dr. Burt does have a question. Can she still use the old CNIB reference for, referral form? Um, sure, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Just to, to separate, if the intention is to have special CNIB services uh, from the CNIB, there is a, a phone number of the CNIB. They have their fax number and their specific form for the services they provide. If, um, if Dr. Bert wants a low vision assessment, then it would have to come through our office. Like, as I mentioned before, if she has a name, uh, along the lines, what we do. Excellent, thank you. So I will wrap it up here. I wanna thank Dr. Markowitz and Dr. Nido, um, as well as Sue and Sonia and Jenny for the great presentations. Um, I will remind everybody, just as an FYI, that our rounds are accredited for, for section one credits, but you must complete the, the evaluation form. And the deadline to submit your previous year's credits is January 31st. So if you haven't gotten them in, make sure you get, make sure you get them in and our grand rounds do get you some credits. So um, okay. 
many people have some homework this weekend, myself included. Thank um, you, Abhandeep. Thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye. Have a nice weekend.